Here we go. Let's get our Bibles. You got your Bibles open? Malachi, the book of Malachi. It's the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. We began a new series two weeks ago uh, titled Malachi, God's Response to Fake Religion. God's response to fake religion, Malachi, written 425 years before Jesus, the last book of the Old Testament. And Malachi was a prophet in Israel. God had raised him up, and here's why God raised him up, because Israel, the people of God, the, God, the, the people that God called to worship him, were worshiping him in a wretched way. It was rancid religion. It was fake church. How many of you have ever seen fake church? On TV, the prosperity gospel or whatever? Yeah, it's prevalent. It's out there. Oh, we're aware of it. There's Jehovah Witnesses. There's Mormons. There's uh, you know, self-realization fellowship. A lot of fake religions out there. But when fake church enters into the real church, that's a problem. And this was what was happening in Israel. Their religion became rancid. And the book of Malachi is God's answer to this rancid religion. And in the book of Malachi, we looked last, uh, at the first week we talked about it. There are seven thesis statements that God gave to the nation Israel. Seven thesis statements to redirect them from this fake religion back into a real relationship with God. And uh, these thesis statements can be found by a statement that God makes followed by an incredulous statement or an incredulous question that the people respond to God's statement on. And so just for example, we'll review the ones that we saw so far. Malachi chapter 1 if you look at verse 2, you see the first thesis statement that God said. It is, I have loved you, says the Lord. And the people respond back with an incredulous remark. How have you loved us? We don't feel very loved. Are you kidding me? And God says, I have loved you. I have loved you with an initiating love. I have loved you with an elective love. I chose you to be my people and to follow me. I elected you. I didn't choose Esau. I didn't choose the other nations. I chose you and I called you to myself. And God starts this message to the, his people who are involved in fake religion, in worthless religion, in rancid religion. And what does he start with? A message of what? Love, always the foundation of our walk with God, our relationship with God. I don't know about you, but if people were wronging me and abusing me and involved in all the turn, everything I gave them into a mess, I wouldn't start with, I have loved you. I'd start with, what the heck is wrong with you, right? But that's not what God does. God starts with a message of love. And may I say this? That is always what he wants us to build our relationship with him on not our love for God but what God's love for us Jesus said the same thing I loved you you didn't love me I called you you didn't call me I chose you you didn't chose me this was my doing in your life the second thesis statement that he makes is found in verse 6 he says as a son honors his father yeah we honor our dads as a servant his master, yeah, we honor our bosses. Boss says, hey, you got to work till 7 o'clock? We work till 7 o'clock. If I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? To you priests who despise my name, and yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? Moi? Us? No, we haven't despised you. We've honored you. Second thesis statement, where's my honor? I've loved you. How come you don't have any reverence for me? Why is there no reverence? And we looked at that last week. If you missed it, you can uh, go back and pick it up online. All of our messages are there for free, or you can podcast them. Today we're going to pick up in verse 11. We're still on this second thesis statement. Where is my honor? God's asking, where is my honor? Hey, are you honoring God? 
Well, the people thought they were because the priest said, uh, God says, where's my honor? Why are you despising my name? And their response was, how have we despised your name? Not us. Oh, it might be surprised. No, yeah, yeah, actually you, God says. Um, uh, let's look, though. Let's jump in, and we'll move to verse 11. Uh, here, God reminds Israel of God's plan for Israel. Look at this. Uh, just kind of setting the stage. Verse 8, they're giving these lame offerings, right? Uh, verse 10, powerful statement we looked at last week. Is there not a man among you who will shut the doors and stop this worthless religion that you're doing? And now today, our message today, God reminds them of his purpose for calling them. Look at this, verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down. Or in other words, from the east all the way to the west. Or in other words, the entire world. From the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among who? The Gentiles, all the nations. My name shall be great among all the nations. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. What's that? What is that? Incense? What do incense represent in the Bible? Prayers, the prayers of the saints. They would offer incense in the tabernacle. They would offer incense in the temple. And it was a symbol. It was a metaphor. It was a picture of the prayers of the saints. Do you know why? Because incense smells sweet. And do you know what your prayers do to God? God says, oh, I just love that. That's a sweet-smelling smell to me, God saying. It's a, just a great aroma. And he says, in every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. A pure offering? Yeah, a pure offering as opposed to a fake offering or a polluted offering or a defiled offering. A pure offering shall be made to my name. Why? For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord. Oh, I love this. It's so important. God brings them back. They had fallen away. And he says, listen, here is I want to remind you. This was my plan for you. Israel, I created you to reveal my glory to the whole world. God created Israel to reveal his glory to the whole world. He wanted the whole world to know about him. And he used Israel for that purpose, that they might be a light to all the other nations, that all the other nations might see, wow, they, they, they serve the real, true, living God. How many of you have watched the Ten Commandments, the old Charlton Heston version, the really old one? How many of you love that movie? Uh, just, it's amazing, right? You know one of my favorite lines in that movie? It's great. You know, uh, Moses brings the plagues on, uh, on, on uh, Egypt. Uh, God does through Moses. And, uh, uh, you know, the Pharaoh keeps hardening his, hardening his heart. Finally, on the last plague, the death of the firstborn, and all you had to do is just believe God, just put the blood of the lamb over the door of your house. What's that a picture of? Jesus, the cross of Jesus, the blood of the lamb over the, 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 the soul, the, over my heart, right? And you, the angel of death will pass over you, have no power over you. Picture of Jesus. Jesus died on Passover, on the very day that happened, uh, all prophetic. Anyway, uh, in the movie, uh, Pharaoh doesn't believe, doesn't believe, hardens his heart, hardens his heart, doesn't believe. And then he loses his son. And uh, you see him in all his pain and his anguish. And here's what he says. His God is God. Wow, wow. Great line in the movie. His God is God. That was God's purpose for the nation Israel. That the whole world would see and know, wow, his, their God is God. And he invites all of us to come and to worship him. He is the true and the living God. He is amazing. Hey, God called Abraham. When did God call Abram? When he was a righteous man? No, he called him when he was a sinful pagan. 
He was living in the Ur of the Chaldeans, in Babylon. He was a, a, a pagan, worshiping other gods. His father, Terah, worshiped other gods. In other words, it was all about me, just living for himself. And God calls him to himself, and he says, Abraham, I want to take you from this, and I want to bring you into fellowship with me, and I want to bring you into a promised land. Abraham goes, great, where is that? He goes, it's a land that I will show you when you just begin to walk with me. Great, tell me where it is. I will, just walk with me. And what God was doing was bringing him into this relationship with God. And God says, Abraham, I have a plan for you. I have big plans for you. I want to teach you my ways. I want you to walk in my ways. And I want to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to make a nation out of you. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring the Messiah through you. And here's why. Because in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. In other words, God's saying, I want to bring a people to myself. I want to reveal all of my ways to them. I want to bring their Savior through them so that all the world will see that their God, what, is God. I called you to be a light unto the Gentiles. That's what he wants you to do. God's purpose was bigger than Abraham. It was bigger than Jacob, who God turned his name into Israel, who had 12 sons. It was bigger than Abram. It was bigger than Israel and his 12 sons. It was bigger than the nation Israel. God's purpose for Israel was be a, to be a beacon of light into the whole world. And Israel had lost that purpose. Here's what God says in Isaiah 49 uh, about that purpose. Read it with me if you will. I love it when the church, by the way, reads God's word with one thunderous voice. So let's hear a thunderous voice. The Lord says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. What's that? Yeah, Isaiah 49, a prophecy written 700 years before Jesus, written all about Jesus, God saying, listen, Israel, I'm doing a way bigger work than just you, this mighty nation. I'm doing a way better work. I'm bringing myself. I'm going to come. I'm going to become a man. I'm going to be the Savior, and I'm going to come through you, and you and he and you will be a light to the entire world that the whole earth might be filled with the glory of God through God's people. This was God's will for God's people. And here's what he says, back to Malachi 11, he says, listen, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. The Gentiles meaning the whole world, all the nations. The purpose of Israel and the purpose of the church is to glorify God in the world. And one of the primary ways we do that is by doing what we just read in Isaiah 49. We point people to Jesus the one who will save them from their sins, the one who will give them grace and mercy, truth and righteousness, instruction in the ways of the Lord so that we can live lives and lives abundantly. Oh, that is how we uh, bring G the, glorify God and bring God, uh, Jesus to the world. And I want you to know, yes, God cares about Abraham individually. And yes, God cares about us individually. But he has much bigger plans. He says, listen, I want to partner with you to reach the lost, to bring them to Jesus, to save them, to give them life, and to show them the abundance of grace and mercy that is available to all who call upon the name of the Lord. This is God's will. And may I share something with you? Just like Israel, you have the same calling on your life. You have the same calling that Israel has. God wants to use you to reveal his glory to others. Did you know that? God wants to use you for that purpose. You can be a domestic missionary. You don't have to go to Sudan. Where is the mission field? I say this all the time. Where is the mission field? It's right here between your two feet. Look down at your shoes right now. Put your feet on the ground. Look between your shoes. You know what I want you to see? That's the mission field. Not just here at church, but the moment you leave, you're entering the mission field. When you go to work tomorrow, guess where you are? You're not at work. Where are you? 
You're on the mission field. Do you know that's, how, that's what God wants to do? He wants to partner with you. He wants to use you to be a light to those who are lost in darkness. He wants you to be able to, to, to know him well enough that you can say, hey, man, you might want to try this. Wow, that was really helpful. Where did you get that? Well, I got it from Jesus. I got it from the Bible. It's God's word. Wow, your God is God. I want to know a God like that. God called you to himself, and he saved you from hell. He saved you from self. He saved you from sin. He saved you from our foolish and destructive habits. And he guided you with his Holy Spirit, and he led you with his word. And he began to, begins to pour his wisdom into you and makes you fruitful. Why? So that you might be a light to the rest of the world. Can I share with you this just very amazing truth? God wants to partner with you to be a builder of men and women. Think of that. God wants to partner with you to be a builder of men and women. To partner with him, to point, him to G- point them to Jesus. That's amazing. What an amazing calling. What a high calling. And it's a glorious thing. Problem is, Israel got so self-absorbed, they got so self-righteous, that they thought God existed to meet their needs. They got things turned around. Instead of seeing themselves as servants of God, they saw God as a servant to them. And that is a tragic thing to have happen. They thought God existed to meet their needs. And you know where you can see this so clearly? In the prayer life of people. Because in prayer, instead of focusing on what God wants, we just start telling God what we want. May I remind us? That's not the purpose of prayer. And they were just making everything about what they wanted. They did not exist to serve God. God existed to serve them. They did not exist to glorify God. They existed to glorify self. And instead of glorifying God, they were glorifying themselves. That was the problem. God created them to reveal his glory to the world, but instead of glorifying God, they glorified themselves. Instead of pointing people to God, they repelled people from God. Crazy. Look again at what God says. Look at his will. This was his plan, not only for Israel, but also for the church. From the rising of the sun, even to its going down, from the east to the west, all across the world, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, among the unbelievers, among all the earth, that in every place incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering, as opposed to a polluted offering. For my name shall be great among the Gentiles, says the Lord of hosts. But instead you profane it, in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit, its food, is contemptible. Wow. Instead of being revealing the glory of God to the rest of the world, instead they profane the name of God. Instead of being glorifying God they defiled the name of God and how did they do it they said the table of the Lord is defiled table of the Lord oh we covered this last week contemptible we covered this last week I'm not going to go into it in detail today if you want to know what that means in depth go back and listen last week but here's what the table of the Lord is the table of the Lord is all of the service to God when you have a A dinner at your house? Oh, it's not just about eating, is it? It's about having everybody over for dinner. It's about the whole time together, right? It's the whole thing. And when he says the table of the Lord, he's talking about all of the service and the worship and the praise and everything that happened, all of the laws, everything. All of it was the table of the Lord. And he says you've made the table of the Lord contemptible. Contemptible, yeah, the Hebrew word, bazaar, it means worthless, meaningless, insignificant. Instead of it being sacred, it was common. And he talks about this defiled food. Where would this food come from? It was the offerings that they were giving. And he says, instead of it being a great meal, it's a rancid, rancid meal, a rancid display. 
What a sad statement. Let's go on. Let's look what he says. He says, you also say, oh, what weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. Weariness? Oh, do we have to go to church again today? All right, kids, get your shoes on. I mean, come on, I guess we'll go. I mean, I really want to do something else, but... And look what he says. It's weariness, and you sneer at it. What is sneering at it? Oh, is he playing that song again? Oh, is he doing that again? You don't take it to heart. You look at it as, oh, uh, uh. You sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And look what you do. And you bring the stolen and the lame and the sick, and thus you bring as an offering. Yeah, same thing we looked at last week in verse 8. You have a one-eyed lamb. He's running into trees. He's good for nothing. And you go, I got an idea. That's what I'll give to God. Not good for anything else. We'll just give it to God. Isn't it interesting when people donate, how they donate the can of lima beans in the pantry instead of the T-bone steak in the fridge, you know? They're just bringing the junk, right? Oh, what weariness. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick, and thus you bring as an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male. And takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. Hey, it's one thing if you bring in a widow's mite, and and God looks at that and he goes, that's the most amazing one-eyed lamb I've ever seen. It's glorious. I love it. It's amazing. You gave all that you had. Amazing. But when you have, look what he says, when you take sacrifices, he, he takes a vow and sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. Takes a vow? What does he mean? Takes a vow. When you, took, when you came to church today, you know what you did? You took a vow. I'm coming to worship you, God. I'm entering into your, to, to, to worship of you. You're taking a vow with the Lord. Are you offering what is blemished and lame? And look what he says. For I am a great king, says Yahweh of hosts, says the Lord of hosts. Or in other words, says the Yahweh of all of the armies. I'm a great king. Talk about an understatement. What an understatement of all understatements. He is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And he holds your very breath in his hand. He is the one making your heartbeat right now. And he could say, you are done. No more heartbeat. And it would be over. I'm a great king. You ought to have some reverence for me. I control every neuron and every, uh, every blood vessel in your brain. I could give you a, a I'm having one right now. I could give you <laughs> an aneurysm and it would be over, over my, your life is in my hands. I'm a great king. You ought to have some reverence for me. Where is my honor? I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Here's the question that I have for you. Here's the question that we have to consider. Why did God's people give God lame offerings? Why would anyone give God lame offerings? Why not just keep your offerings to yourself? Why give God a lame offering? Just keep it. Why give God a lame offering? Two reasons on your screens. Number one, they saw themselves as good people. They saw themselves as good people. Number two, they saw little need for divine forgiveness. They saw themselves as good people. Yeah, they thought, yeah, I'm pretty good. Yeah. uh, uh, How many of you see yourself, don't raise your hand. How many of you see yourself as a good person? Hey, here's what I know. 
I'm not a good person. I want to be a good person, but do you know who I am? I'm a selfish person. And if I see myself as a good person, I'm delusional, right? When you read God's, Bible, God's Word, when you read your Bible, what does it tell us? It tells us how to be a good person, how to know God, how to walk like God, how to, what God wants. And if there's anything I know, I don't measure up to that. We just look at the very first commandment. The very first commandment, what is it? You shall have no other gods before me. You know one thing I know about myself? I don't keep that commandment. There are a lot of other gods in my life. And some of you are going, oh, really? You're horrible. Not me. No, you're deceived. You too. That thing that's 55 inches in your house that you sit and worship at for four hours every night, guess what that is becoming? Did you spend more time in front of that or with God? Now, my point isn't to make you feel bad or say that you can't watch TV. My point is to say you're not a good person. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Neither am I. This commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Have you ever loved your neighbor as yourself? I've never loved my neighbor as much as I love myself. I've always thought of me first. This commandment, don't lie. What am I, what, what's the point? We're not good people. This commandment, don't commit adultery. Every guy in this room, Jesus brought it to the truth of what that commandment is, right? You look at a woman to lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. You're not pure is what God is saying, right? Here's the issue. I, mean, I wish I had a woman's mind. Women are wired differently. Men are disgusting. <laughs> We're not good people. And if we think that we are, we will give God lame offerings, we will not see a need for a Savior. We will not come to church and say, God, I am so amazed at who you are. You forgive me. You, you heal me. You bring righteousness to me even though I'm so wicked. You lead, guide, and direct me. You give me mercy and grace every single morning. God, you're amazing. I want to give you my very best. If you think you are a good person, that will not be happening. Instead of reading their Bible and saying, I'm, in, I'm a sinner, I'm in need of a Savior, they said, man, I'm a good person. I read my Bible every day. I read my, I have my devotions every morning, and I make sure to post about it on social media so everybody knows what a good person I really am. And instead of being a light to the world, you are now a stench to the world because you're self-righteous. That's what was happening in God's people. Number two... They saw little need for divine forgiveness. Hey, if you are not a sinner, if you're proud of your righteousness, can I just tell you something? Going to church is pretty unnecessary. Don't really need to go. Praising Jesus is not your priority. Worshiping God, why would I do that? Giving an offering, well, you got to give something. Let's give something lame. Because it's just not a priority. I'm righteous. And that's what they're saying. Oh, it was so wearisome. Just so wearisome to go worship God. Do we have to do that again? Didn't we do that last week? So wearisome. Oh, there he is. He preaches so long. Didn't Kyle play that song last week? Oh, it's so loud in here. Can't they turn the music down? Right? Why? Because we're just... We have little need for divine forgiveness. Little need. Sinners have little need for divine worship. Sinners, excuse me, uh, self-righteous have little need for divine worship. Sinners are just the opposite, man. Sinners are not wor wearied by the opportunity to worship Jesus. You know what sinners do? Sinners run to the arms of Jesus. Jesus said something very interesting. It might wake you up. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. You know who his sheep are? Sinners. 
Sinners are the one that hear his voice and follow him. They say, yes, I need forgiveness. I'll follow you wherever you go. I need what you have to offer. Those are the ones that hear his voice. Sinners. My sheep know my voice and they follow me. I have no interest in going to the doctor today. I have no interest in going to the doctor tomorrow. I have no interest in going to the doctor next week or next month. As a matter of fact, I could go the next decade very happily without going to the doctor. Do you know why? Because I don't think there's anything wrong with me. I have no need. However, there was a time a year and a half ago, I had a pulled muscle in my back. And that muscle began to spasm. And it began to spasm so bad, I looked like the hunchback in Notre Dame. I was like, I couldn't stand still, I couldn't lay down, I couldn't sit up, I couldn't do anything. I was in intense pain. This thing was just spasming and it would not let go. And you know what I could not wait to do? Go to a doctor. I called the doctor, he couldn't fit me in. I would have called 25 doctors until I got in, and I couldn't wait to go get that cortisone shot and release that muscle because I needed healing. I got a picture for you. I got a picture for you. Uh, here's a guy in India. I saw this on Fox News this week. A guy in India who got impaled by a piece of bamboo. Take a look at this. Oh, by the way, if you got a weak stomach, close your eyes. Look at the size of that thing big honking bamboo piece stuck into him. You think that's bad? Look at the x-ray. Oh my goodness. You know what? You and I have been impaled with something far worse than that big honking piece of bamboo. You and I have been impaled with sin. David said it this way, I was born in it. I was conceived in it. It's in my DNA. I have something far worse. You have something far worse than that big honking piece of bamboo. And you, how many of you have had that piece of bamboo and you go, I need a doctor? Yeah, you'd go running. Miraculously, by the way, that guy was okay. None of his organs injured. Amazing. But here's the point. You have a honking way worse log going all the way through you. It's not just in your side. It's in every part of your body, and it's called sin. And if you are aware of it, you will have a strong desire to come to the great physician. His name is Jesus, and he is amazing. I tell you what, man, you and I need a Savior. Do you know why? Because we can't keep God's laws not even for one day. Moses couldn't keep them, Elijah couldn't keep them, Ezekiel couldn't keep them, Peter couldn't keep them, Paul couldn't keep them, and the priest of Israel couldn't keep them either. And do you think you're going to do any better? Not a chance. Romans 6.23, God makes it very clear, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. None of us measure up to it. Not one of us keep the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Not one of us love our neighbor as ourselves. Not one of us do not lie. Not, so let's not think we're good people. We're not good people. We're loved people. We're people who are loved by our Heavenly Father. And says that, come, let us reason together. Even though your sin is as scarlet, you come to me and I'll wash you and I'll make you white as snow. I'm a great physician. I can get that thing out of your side and I can heal you. What an amazing God. We have a God who says, listen, I know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he says, here's the wages of that. What's the wages of that? The wages of sin is what, church? Death. Death, death? what does that mean? Here's what it means. It means physical death. It means spiritual death. It means eternal death. It means complete and total separation from God. Not just here today while you're living, but for all eternity, eternally separated from God. God says, I can save you from that. 
I can save you from hell. I can save you from all. And here's what I want. I don't know about you. I want to be saved from that. I want to be saved from being separated from God because here's what I found. Dwelling in God's presence is the most amazing place to be. And you know when I want to dwell there? Not when I go to heaven. I want to dwell where? I want to dwell right now. In my marriage, I want to dwell in the presence of God. And I am. And you know what? I've got an amazing marriage as a result. Oh, I sin all the time. So does Lisa. But we just come to our Savior. He cleans us up. And we have an amazing marriage. I want to dwell in the presence of of God as a dad. I want to have great relationships with my kids. I want to be able to speak wisdom into their life. I want to be in ministry with God. I want to be a light to the rest of the world. I want to be a builder of man. I want to be partnering with God to bring the kingdom of God to the rest of the world so that these people who are walking around impaled and not knowing why they're in so much pain and trying to anesthetize that big thing in them with alcohol and sex and materialism and prosperity and anything they can do to try to anesthetize this pain that they're feeling could be healed and have a new life full of glory in the presence of Jesus Christ. This is what God wants to do with Israel. That's what he called them. And unfortunately, in self-righteousness, Israel was no longer glorifying God. No longer being a good witness to the other nation. They distorted God's laws and said, yeah, I do that, I do that. Aren't I amazing? Look at me. I mean, I'm just so darn righteous. They distorted God's offerings. And instead of giving wonderful offerings, offerings of love and appreciation, I just can't wait to worship you, it was wearisome. (laughs) And instead of worship, they gave lip service. And instead of a sacrificial system that would point the world to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, they gave lame offerings. Instead of being a witness, they were a witness of God's glory. They were just a detestable witness. They were a disgrace. Here's the question. What will God do? What will God do when the very people God called to reveal the true and living God to the rest of the world are misrepresenting God through fake religion? What will God do? Israel was called by God to be a light to the rest of the world, to reveal God's truth, his righteousness, his wisdom, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. But instead of glorifying God, Israel's vain religion is defiling God. Here's the question, what will God do? God, what will you do? Well, the answer might shock you. It's going to shock you. You thought that bamboo in the side was shocking? Look at chapter 2. And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. Got a message for you, priest. Who does God come to for the problem of this fake church? Who does he go to? He goes to the pastors. Listen, pastors, this message is for you. Oh, I tell you, I look at the fake churches going on in here in North County, and oof, man. This is God's message to fake pastors. Here it is. It's shocking. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, here we see the grace of God. If you will hear, it'll be different. If you will take it to heart, it'll be different. But if you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I've cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants, And I will spread refuse on your faces. Refuse, that's a real nice word for what? Dung. And dung is a real nice word for what the Hebrew is. I will put dung on your faces, God says to the priest, and the dung of your solemn feast. Yeah, I'll put dung on all your church services, all your self-righteousness and your fake teachings, all your prosperity teachings, I'll put dung all over it. And I will take you away with all that dung. And then you shall know that I, the true and living God, have sent this commandment to you when judgment comes upon you. You will know the real God. That my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. 
that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. Here's some really cool things here. Um, God says, I'm going to smear dung on the face of the priests. What an amazing metaphor. What an amazing picture that is. You know what it's saying? Uh, we, we have to really know our Bible to know what God is saying here. He's painting a picture for us. Dung would do something. Dung would make a priest ceremonially unclean. A priest, in order to do service to God, he had to go in, and before he could even enter the temple, before he could be even put on the priestly robes, he had to be ceremonially washed. And any dung would disqualify him for service. And God says, I'm going to put dung on your face. And you're not even going to be able to come into my temple courts. And to that message, to all the prosperity teachers, I say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is his message, man. This is what he's going to do. He's saying, listen, you're going to be unfit for service in the temple. Uh, you know what, was, what they were to do with the dung? They were to take it outside of the temple courts. They were to take it far away, and they were to burn it. Here's a verse for you, just for reference sake. Exodus 29. Read this with me out loud. The flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung you shall burn with fire outside of the camp. And God is saying, priest, that's what I'm going to do with you. Wow. Wow. The symbolism is amazingly rich. And if you think God uh, is okay with all this prosperity teaching, uh, now you know his heart. Number two, God says, I'm going to curse their blessings. Their blessings? Yeah, the blessings that they would pronounce upon the people, God says, I'm going to curse those blessings. What was that? Yeah, well, they would bring their one-eyed lamb. It was a lame offering. And the priest would take it and they'd say, oh, God bless you, brother. Your sins are forgiven. God is going to bless you. Go in prosperity. I just want to be popular. I want everybody to like me. I want to build the biggest following I possibly can. Blessings on anything you do. And God says, not in my house. I'm not receiving it. I'm cursing it. What's that? Yeah, these false priests. Hey, give your seed offering to the Lord, the seed offering. And they get, start talking with a weird voice, why, I don't know. But they start, give a seed offering. What is a seed offering? They're trying to get money out of you, and the promise that they give you is what? God will do what? Give you more money. So now why are you giving to God? Because you love God or because you love what? Money. You just want more money. It has nothing to do with God. You're not serving God. God's just serving you now. See how quickly it gets turned around? And they tell the people, oh, bless you. You gave a big offering. God's really going to bless you. And you know what God says? No, I'm not. I curse that. This is God's heart. This is who he is. God says, that's fake. I want nothing to do with it. Christian, be wise. Do not be surprised that fake churches and fake pastors exist. Do not be unwise. Do not be deceived. Do not follow after them. This is God's response to fake religion, and it's always been there from the beginning, from the days of Cain and Abel. Jesus told us about it. Matthew 7, on your screens, take a look. Matthew 7, Read with me, church. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Haven't we cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, stop, stop. The most horrific words you could ever hear. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What a waste to think that all the religion you did was worthless and in vain. And this message to you from Malachi is to prevent us. This is God's response to fake religion. Don't go there, he says. Don't go there. Don't be surprised that these things happen. Here's another thing. Here's what Paul said about it in 2 Corinthians on your screens. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. Speaking of these, these fake teachers, here's what God says. Read with me. Such men are false apostles, 
deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. God will spread refuse on their face and he will take them out of service and he will take them outside the camp and he will burn them. In Malachi, God is removing these corrupt priests from service and bringing judgment on them. And he says, listen, I don't want to do that. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, I will do this. But if you will hear, I don't want to bring judgment on you. Uh, Please, take it seriously. You better listen, he says. And you know what's sad? Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, 425 years before Jesus. And here's what we see. God doesn't speak. He says, I really want you to listen to this message. And now the Messiah comes 400 years later. And what does Jesus find with all the priests in his day? They did not take the message to heart. They were still self-righteous. So self-righteous that they rejected who? The Savior. Why did they reject the Savior? Because they had no need to be saved. Why did they have no need to be saved? Because they thought they were good people. Fake religion. We're not good people. I'm not a good person. I'm a love person. I'm a person covered by the grace of Jesus Christ. I'm a person who God's mercies are new morning by morning. Hey, may we not think we can just ignore God's word and simply get away with it. Pay attention. Notice how sin blinds our eyes. We become unable to see even our own bad behaviors. These hypocrites did not know they were blind. These priests would boast in their greatness of God and their knowledge of God. They thought they were right with God, but their actions betray their superficial nature of their supposed faith. How have we despised your name? We're the priests. We honor you every day. No, not a chance, God says. Not a chance. I have a question for you. Christian, do you see yourself as a good person? Or do you struggle with your sin nature? Do you mourn the weakness of your flesh? Do you say, oh, Lord, man, I'm so sorry I've blown it again. Gosh, I hate that. Are you quick to repent and say, Jesus, please forgive me, man. I can't believe I did that again. Lord, please forgive me. And do you praise him for his amazing grace that he so freely gives, that he just loves to pour out upon you? Can I tell you something? If that is you, I do not worry about your salvation. I do not worry about the weakness of your flesh. I do not worry about the genuineness of your faith. You are in a good place. You who are struggling with sin. You know who I worry about? Those who aren't struggling with sin. That's who I worry about. To him who thinks he's right with God and is totally unaware of his sin, he may find himself in great danger just like these priests are. That's who I'm concerned about. I want to close the last couple of minutes with uh, God's rewards for a real relationship with him. Those who have a real relationship with him. Look what he says here. Let's back up a second. God says, I'm, we'll go to verse 4. Uh, I'm going to bring this judgment on you. I'm going to get rid of these false priests. Uh, I'm going to take them out of my temple. I'm going to take them out and, and burn them outside the camp. And this judgment is going to come for this reason. That my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. The covenant with Levi? What covenant was that? Well, Levi was the tribe who was chosen to be the priest to God. And here's what he's saying. Yeah, you priests are wicked, but I'm not done done with pastors. I'm not done with priests. I'm still into priests. And here we see the grace of God. I'm removing these false priests because I'm going to keep my covenant to have a priesthood. And I'm so thankful. 
You know, I see these false pastors, these prosperity pastors, and you know what I say? I go, man, I hate being a pastor. I don't want to be associated with that in any way, shape, or form. And you know the one thing that keeps me in ministry? There's one verse that keeps me in ministry. You want to know what it is? It pleases God by the foolishness of man's preaching to save those who believe. For reasons that we don't have time to go into now, but there's good reasons. I've thought a lot about it. There's good reasons. God said, I want to reveal myself through a fallen man. Instead of opening the skies of heaven and having the heavens recede and showing my glory and having angels proclaim my gospel, who could do a much better job, by the way, I want to use men, uh, and it pleases man, it pleases God by the foolishness of man's preaching to save those who believe. And here we see that heart of God. He says, listen, I'm not done with the priesthood. I want my covenant with Levi, the priesthood, to continue. That's grace. And here's why. Because this is what a real priesthood looks like. This is what a real relationship with God looks like. I'm going to give you four things real quick. Write them down quickly. Get ready. Four things as we close. We've only got four minutes. Four things on what a real relationship with God does. It makes you a light to the whole world. Here they are. You ready? Number one. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. What's that? Yes, I'll make a covenant of salvation with him. It's a covenant of abundant life, and it's a covenant of peace with God. Jesus called it the new covenant. It's a better covenant. It's a covenant built on his righteousness, not mine. It's a covenant that says, I know you can't keep this, no problem. I will show you grace and mercy and forgiveness. I will bathe your unrighteousness, and I will trade you your wickedness for my righteousness. There is only one and one ever who was able to keep all of God's laws. He never broke them. It wasn't Moses. It wasn't any other man of faith. There was only one. Who was it? Jesus. But I'm going to say something shocking to you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that Jesus kept all the commandments. Because Jesus could have kept all of the commandments and it wouldn't have helped you or I one bit. Unless he went to the cross to take the punishment of my sin. Because in taking the punishment of my sin, I can now take the righteousness of his life. Spurgeon called it the great exchange. If I acknowledge that I need a savior, Jesus went to the cross to take all of my sin. And he says, I'll take all that for you. Sin must be punished. It's either going to be, the dung must be removed from the camp. It's either going to be removed from with you, or it's going to be removed with what Jesus did to the cross. But either way, it must be removed. No dung in the camp, not in God's camp. And here's what he says. I have a new covenant that I will make with him. It's a covenant of life, and it's a covenant of peace. And the peace is peace with God, a peace that surpasses understanding. That's number one. Number two, and I will give to him, excuse me, and I gave them to him that he might fear me, so he feared me and was reverent before my name. He's saying, I gave this new covenant to him, this covenant of life and peace. Why? That he might fear me, so he feared me and was reverent before my name. The second part of a real relationship with God is that you have a real reverence for the lordship of Jesus Christ. You have a real reverence for God. I gave them this covenant of life and peace that he might fear me and be reverent before my name. Number three, verse six, the law of truth was in his mouth. Yeah, it was in his heart. It was just on his lips all the time. And injustice was not found on his lips for he walked with me in peace and in equity. What's the third result of a real relationship with God, fellowship with God, fellowship with God. You're actually in a real relationship with God and not in man-made religion. Look what he says. He walked with me in peace and in equity. That's God speaking. You actually walk with God. His will for our life, why he created us. 
Aren't you glad to know you can stand before him on that day? And instead of saying, hey, depart from me, I never knew you, he'll say, yeah, all this was really real. And here I am, I'm before the Lord, and oh my gosh, he's my savior. He did cleanse me, I'm righteous. And now my sin nature is taken away. I've been given a new body, I've been given a glorified nature, I've been given a, I'm right, I'm, I'm transformed in the image of Jesus Christ. And it'll be very real, not a man-made religion. And lastly, second half of verse 6. And turn many away from iniquity, for the lips of the priest should keep knowledge. In other words, the lips of the priest should have wisdom. They should speak with intelligence. They should speak wise things, life-giving truths. And people should seek the law from his mouth. Hey, can I talk to you? I got this issue. I got this boyfriend. I got this problem. I got this fight. I got this kid. And they will seek wisdom from your lips. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. The fourth result of a real relationship with God, you will be a light to the rest of the world. You'll be a light to others. You'll be partnering with God in building his kingdom. You'll be an instrument in his hands. You'll be a, a, a son working with his dad in the kingdom business. You'll be a missionary on the mission field wherever you go. And you will have life, life abundantly, and purpose beyond all purpose. This is the heritage for those who really walk with the Lord. God has called you to glorify him. May we be about our Father's business. Amen?